In this webinar, we look at three generalized areas of risk management, arbitration agreements, anti-harassment policies, and releases. In all three of these areas, you are likely to be working with attorneys on the planning side, but it is important for you to understand the legal requirements that are driving their advice. And, as is often the case, even the best crafted legal documents will have no value if there is not adequate on-the-ground implementation, which will be partly your job. The three areas we are examining all vary widely from one another, but they have in common the goal of reducing the employer's risk of legal liability. Let's first look at the use of arbitration agreements. Quite a few employers require these of all employees, and probably most large employers do so. But certainly, not all do, and that's because there's a division of opinion as to whether these clauses are, on balance, beneficial to employers. Some management side attorneys actually believe that arbitration clauses encourage employee claims, since there's no need to hire an attorney, although attorneys can certainly be involved, and the very informality of the process makes pursuing a claim less dramatic. But even if more claims are pursued, the proponents of arbitration respond that the total costs of arbitration and any adverse decisions are likely to be lower than the total cost of litigating fewer claims in court. Further, to the extent that an arbitration agreement can foreclose claims by multiple employees by also precluding joint or class arbitration, the use of such clauses is an insurance policy against the downside risk of very large liability. For example, a Fair Labor Standards Act claim by one worker may pose no meaningful exposure, but the same claim by, say, every manager could result in liability running in the millions of dollars. An arbitration agreement will by definition prevent a class action in court and can be drafted to also bar class arbitration. But there is a caveat here. Such an agreement has been challenged by the National Labor Relations Board. As is often the case, our advice is to consult your attorney. Assuming that you, in consultation with counsel, decide to use some form of arbitration agreement, there are still serious questions about how the agreement should be drafted. These include what arbitral forum to use and who pays for the arbitration, and whether the arbitration agreement will try to contract what might otherwise be an employee's rights. On each of these issues, there are more aggressive and more conservative positions, and again, attorney advice is critical. One area that's likely to fall squarely within your jurisdiction is obtaining and documenting employee consent to whatever agreement you decide on. This is relatively easy with new employees, who can be required to sign such an agreement along with other paperwork you provide. Some firms even require applicants to sign such agreements as a condition of being considered. But it's more complicated, or at least more of a headache, with current employees. Some firms have tried the quick and easy way to get consent. Inclusion in employee handbooks or emails attaching the agreement. We strongly advise against anything short of obtaining each worker's signature on a separate arbitration agreement, a document that should then be placed in the employee's personnel file. Better safe than sorry. The next risk management technique we will consider is employee policies regarding sexual harassment. These have three thrusts. First, every employer should have in place policies prohibiting sexual and other harassment, and more importantly, defining what conduct is barred. Your firm undoubtedly has such a policy, most probably vetted by counsel, so we won't discuss this further, other than to note that such policies typically deal with any manifestation of the prohibited conduct. Most often, harassment becomes actionable not because one incident is severe, but rather because of an accumulation of incidents that becomes pervasive. However, just as giant oaks from little acorns grow, it's important to deal with incidents before they become problems. That doesn't necessarily mean a zero-tolerance policy of firing someone for an off-color joke, but it does mean discouraging conduct that, if it continued, might make the employer liable. Second, employer policies regarding harassment need to establish a procedure for dealing with any complaints. Again, your firm almost certainly has such a policy developed in consultation with counsel, and we won't delve into these at any length. Almost certainly, 
HR will be involved in implementation, if not as one of the go-to departments for complaints, then as responsible for dealing with a complaint once it arises. We'll content ourselves here with stressing that prompt attention to and appropriate dealing with alleged incidents of harassment is critical should the matter later become a suit or even be raised in an arbitration. That's because employer liability is likely to turn on the affirmative defense. To summarize briefly, an employer is absolutely liable for harassment by a supervisor that culminates in a tangible employment action. In contrast, it is only presumptively liable for supervisor harassment that creates a contaminated work environment because it has an affirmative defense. And it is liable for harassment by coworkers or even third parties only if it knows and does not act reasonably in preventing or addressing the harassment. The bottom line, then, is that the employer may often avoid liability if it exercised reasonable care to prevent and correct promptly any sexually harassing behavior. And that means disseminating appropriate policies, providing appropriate training, and appropriately dealing with alleged violations, all of which is likely to be HR's responsibility. But doing all of that is not necessarily going to be enough to avoid liability in all cases. You need to be careful about the problem of what we call paper compliance. That is, a dramatic gulf between what the company says its policy is and actually practices on the ground. This obviously poses an enormous challenge for HR. On the one hand, you might not know about the kinds of comments that supervisors are making. And even if HR is aware of the problem, the individuals involved may be pretty high up in the organization. You see the problem. The closest thing we can suggest to a solution is for HR to view itself as responsible for changing the corporate culture to the extent that culture poses legal risks for the employer. And we're not talking merely about inappropriate sexist comments. Remember that discrimination claims on the basis of race, religion, age, and disability often turn on whether managers make statements evidencing bias. Changing a corporate culture can be hard, but it can be essential to risk management in the personnel arena. The third risk management technique you should be familiar with is releases, sometimes called waivers, of liability. These can be used to settle a case after it's brought. For example, once a suit is filed, it's pretty standard practice for any settlement reached to not only provide for the dismissal of the case with prejudice, that is, without the right to refile, but also for each party to give the other a general release of liability for any cause of action whatsoever. Some of the language used in these releases can be humorous. For example, standard forms often release claim from the beginning of the world, which seems like a tad of overkill, but the intent of the release is obviously serious, and the last thing a defendant wants is to settle a case with a plaintiff who immediately files suit on another legal ground. Still, if a lawsuit has been filed, legal counsel will handle it and undoubtedly prepare the release. More in your bailiwick are releases that your firm should require as a condition of providing enhanced benefits upon termination of employment. Typically, in a reduction of force, but often in individual cases where an employee is being terminated and the employer wishes to guard against any potential later suit. A release, then, is kind of an insurance policy, and like all policies, comes at a price. When an employee is terminated, for whatever reason, the employer must pay him what he is owed, compensation to the date of termination, and accrued vacation pay, perhaps compensation for some portion of accrued sick leave if you have such a policy, and maybe even some kind of contractually mandated severance. Of course, the latter is probably dependent on not being fired for cause, but the point is that the employer must pay what is owed. If the employer also wants to obtain a release from the employee, it has to pay something more. The Older Workers Benefit Protection Act validates a release only in exchange for consideration in addition to anything of value to which the individual is already entitled. But the concept applies more generally. By executing a release, the employee is giving up something of value and, to be enforceable, his promise to do so must be made in return for something of value. That something is typically severance pay, but it theoretically could be anything 
that the employer is not already required to provide. Just like an insurance policy doesn't necessarily cover all risks, not all releases are necessarily valid. In other words, you can't really guarantee no liability. And even the legal standards for validity vary from normal contract requirements, mostly offer acceptance and consideration, to a somewhat heightened knowing and voluntary standard, which looks more closely at the language and position of the employees, to the OWBPA, which imposes certain formal requirements that must be strictly followed, to the requirement of approval by court or the Department of Labor for release of wage and hour claims. The OWBPA is generally considered the gold standard for releases of federal claims. While most federal statutes do not impose nearly so high bar, it's best practice to follow the OWBPA approach in obtaining releases, even though that approach, with its minimum 21-day notice and 7-day right of revocation, can be awkward to implement and leave everyone hanging for a bit. The challenge in trying to adapt the OWBPA standard to more general releases is really to list all the claims that are being released as specifically as possible. For example, a well-drafted release should mention pretty much all of the federal and state laws that might bear on the relationship, in addition to releasing all claims of any kind from the beginning of the world to the present. A final note, even an OWBPA release is not necessarily bulletproof. It can still be challenged on grounds that could be used to challenge any contract, such as fraud and duress. The lesson here is not to make any statements in connection with the termination that could later be challenged as fraudulent or threatening. Oh.